Welcome to All About Hopkinton, the HCAM original program highlighting the people and organizations that make Hopkinton a great place to live. I'm Mary Arnott, your host. Today we have with us David Youngberg, the principal of Elmwood School. Welcome, David. We're very glad that you're here, and you're no stranger to HCAM. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I was looking at your background and your uh, work history with Elmwood. You're, you've had uh, been teacher and assistant principal and involved for many years. That's wonderful. How has that helped you in being principal there now? Well, I started out my career um, as a teacher and I've had the opportunity uh, to be in several different types of school districts. I've been in urban districts, uh, suburban districts, and um, each of those places presented with it uh, different challenges and um, I've been able to enjoy having those experiences. So bringing those with me along with the experiences of having great mentors along the way. Um, I had several principals and assistant principals that I worked with who were always very supportive and uh, always um, you know, very willing to share with me their experiences and expertise in terms of their educational philosophies and their um, administrative management styles and each one had a slightly different style. All of them along the way encouraged me uh, to think about a future in school administration and so when the opportunity came up for me um, to do so I jumped on that and uh, that started my career here as an administrator in Hopkinton five years ago as an assistant principal. And so I took the experiences I had as a teacher and I think the most important thing to remember is the roots of why you go into education. And for me, that was all about um, putting children first. And um, in, in all my decision making as a teacher and also as an administrator, when it comes to making difficult decisions, I always think along the lines of what's most important for children. Mm. So that's really helped to guide me along the way. Um, and as I came to be here, at uh, Elmwood School, my predecessor, Eileen Silver, she was a great mentor to me as well. She had a great wealth of experience. Mm -hmm. And having had so much experience in Hopkinton, she shared a lot of that with me to help prepare me for uh, the principalship when that uh, opportunity arose. Well, that's wonderful. It seems like you really enjoyed being a teacher as well. And so being a principal, what do you like most about that? I think uh, each different role comes with its own set of challenges and I think uh, working as a principal has enabled me to reach beyond um, the children in my classroom. It's given me an opportunity to work with adults, um, different adults in the community, uh, including teachers, other administrators, um, having interactions with parents in the community and being able to um, really experience some great teaching that happens in all different classrooms. And what I like to do is share those ideas, things that I see um, going on in one classroom, I can share that with a teacher in another classroom and have those great discussions about best practices and what we can do um, to reach children and, uh, and their interests and capitalize on that so that they have a successful educational experience. Well, it's obvious you're very passionate about education, not only for the children, but for yourself. You have two master's degrees, and you talked about people that helped you along the way. Who really inspired you to become an educator? When I was younger, believe it or not, I actually wanted to be a pilot, an airline uh -huh. pilot. And my grandfather, who during World War II, he was an engineer, and he actually worked on airplane engines, and he said, you don't want to be a pilot. And so I used to talk very early on um, with my parents and grandparents about things that I aspired to do. And mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to work at a summer camp early on. I was about 14 or 15, and I became a counselor in training. And I followed that route all the way up to becoming a senior counselor and eventually a camp director. So all along the way, through my youth, I was working with children, um, as well as through my church at the time, I was a youth director, assistant youth director, and I just always enjoyed those experiences. Mm -hmm. And that, in combination with my, my love of learning, I love to constantly learn about new things, and so that put together was a perfect formula for, uh, for working as a teacher, and my grandparents really um, talked with me a lot about that, and um, that really inspired me to take that route. So 
uh, I began early on and then along the way as I mentioned in my experiences as a teacher I was able to work with some great mentors that really taught me a lot about uh, working with children and the importance of um, providing the best educational experiences that we can because it's a big responsibility um, and I think uh, folks um, that that are in teaching are, are always very passionate about it. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like Grandpa gave you some good advice there. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> Just sure curious, did. did you ever learn how to fly, though? No, I never did. I wish I had, and maybe someday I will. Who well, knows? Well, there's plenty of time, <laughs> but your grandparents gave you some good advice. Absolutely. And speaking of inspiration, one of the things that seems to be very inspirational at the Elmwood School is when the marathon Boston Marathon's in town, and the runners come and do presentations there, and they have year after year. Why do you think the kids and the parents enjoy that so much? What you I think that is a great tradition yeah. part that has become part of the fabric of Hopkinton, and it's something that everyone in the community really looks forward to and mm -hmm. has really embraced. And for the experience to have world-class runners come and visit our students um, is just there, there's nothing that compares to that. It's uh, because the children are learning about Kenya, so we weave into our curriculum um, some of the experiences that they, um, they would have if they were living in Kenya, mm -hmm. and to really um, enable them to have a background knowledge so that when the runners come, they have a sense of connection with them. And our third graders in particular have that opportunity when the Kenyan runners come into their classrooms after our pep rally, the students get to interact with the runners and ask them um, personal questions that they've thought about and prepared ahead of time. And they get to actually interact and connect with them on that level. And I think the community and the parents really understand the importance of that and opening our doors to um, folks that, um, that come from other parts of the world. And I also think that uh, Hopkinton is becoming a more diverse community and it is just as important that um, we recognize that and celebrate that as part of what we do within our schools um, because our schools play such an important role um, representing the community. I really always enjoy, I don't get to make it over to Elmwood School when the Kenyan runners are there, but I always really enjoy watching the HCAM has, you know, uh, puts the show on and I get to see afterwards and see all the kids reacting and the program. It's wonderful. It is great. Yeah. It is great. And while we're on the international topic, um, you were gracious enough to do a show with HCAM on your trip to China and finding out all about the school systems there. And for those viewers who didn't get a chance to watch that show yet, but I'll encourage them to do that. It's, uh, mm -hmm. The program was uh, Stage 3250 and you did a wonderful presentation on your trip to China. Maybe you could tell us something about that here. Sure, absolutely. I had the opportunity as part of a, um, a grant through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to join uh, 22 other educators and administrators from around the country. Mm -hmm. And we were selected through an application process um, to uh, take a trip over to China. And we visited several different parts of China. So we visited both urban and rural school settings. And we had the opportunity to see teachers teaching. And we had uh, opportunities to visit with students and teachers. We had opportunities to visit with administrators. And our purpose was to learn about the successes and the challenges that the Chinese education system is facing and what we can learn from that and how we can take those um, learned um, lessons and apply them to what we're doing here in the US education system. Uh, there were several parallels that I thought were quite interesting. Um, I'll touch upon a couple of them, sure. um, one of which was some, some of the challenges that the uh, Chinese education faces, of course, is um, the population and being able to meet the demands of all of the children um, there. And mm -hmm. so the population of the cities is um, exploding, essentially. And so folks are moving in from the rural and suburban um, districts and counties for the sole purpose of making sure that their children are getting a quality education. Mm. What's interesting is that in China, the best education systems tend to be in the cities. And that's because they have the most uh, resources available to them. And they're able to recruit um, some of the best teachers. And essentially, the resources um, go towards 
uh, those, the school buildings are newer, um, the school books and facilities are, um, are in good condition, and they have very good training. So that brings in um, folks from other areas of the country. Um, one of the challenges that they face with that is how to meet the demands of the increasing population. Their class sizes are 40, 50, and sometimes even higher in terms of the number of students that a teacher has in front of them on any given day. So trying to imagine what that would be like having even as young as kindergarten, having 30 to 40 or more kindergartners in your classroom, um, that is just an absolutely um, overwhelming um, thought just to, um, just to meet the needs of, of their students. So that's one of the challenges that they face. Um, what I found paralleled with the U.S. education system is that they have the districts, again, that I alluded to that don't have those resources mm -hmm. and are trying to provide um, the best quality education that they can. And um, across the country in the United States, we have that um, same challenge. So, um, so I, f I found that to be very interesting. And uh, what we are all facing, and what I mean by that is both the Chinese and U.S. education system, is the demand for um, having successful graduation rates and setting up students for a very competitive um, job market once they graduate from school or from college and making sure that they're college or career ready. And so in the U.S., we're facing that now and um, with some of the policies that are in place, um, you know, some of the new testing systems with PARC, um, MCAS is now moving to PARC, there's a great emphasis on um, testing and that essentially is the measurement of success of your school or school district. And so there, that puts a lot of pressure on um, performance for school districts. That's mm -hmm. how they're measured. Similarly, in China, children as early as age 14 and 15 are preparing just to get into a high quality high school. So they take these high stakes tests hmm. and um, it puts a tremendous amount of stress on their, um, on their students. So I think that that is a similar concern that both Chinese and U.S. educators have is the amount of stress that we're placing upon our children. Well, you made several good points there. Uh, when you're talking about the class sizes, I thought I could never even imagine having 40 or 50 students in a classroom here in Hopkinton. I mean, we would just be outraged you know, by yeah. that. Yes, uh, yes. I know we're experiencing a little population boom and we're building another school and probably down the future maybe another, but never you know, something like that. I think, what is around 20, 25, and we say, wait, wait a minute, that's way too many students. Yes, you know, that's yeah. a lot of. It, it absolutely puts things into perspective. Yes. And uh, when you think about um, the, uh, you know, the, the types of um, ways that we try to implement high quality education in Hopkinton especially. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about class size, which I, I do believe is a great emphasis that's an important one yes. because you have a smaller um, ratio of students to teachers and I think that um, enables teachers to have a, a much more personal connection with students and it enables them to get to know their students' needs in terms of their learning styles mm -hmm. and helps them to um, helps the teachers to institute the best education for those students. Yeah. And in contrast, you talked about the city schools versus uh, maybe suburban or, and you know, out here, Hopkinton's ranked in the top 10% of all school districts. And you know, so we have very good schools compared to maybe some of the city schools. And, and we're very yeah, fortunate. We're very I think a lot of that really um, is a direct attribute to the community support that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a very well-educated community that understands um, the importance of uh, and the value of a high quality education mm -hmm. and the attributes that schools need to have in order to provide that high quality education. Mm -hmm. So um, that has made a tremendous difference for the Hopkinton Public Schools. And you mentioned the testing that goes on, not only in China, but here, you know, the standards and everything. So there's a lot of emphasis on the math and the reading and the science. What other areas are really important at Elmwood? Well, one of the, one of the uh, things that we've been working on as a district K to five, mm -hmm. um, meaning uh, with the involvement of Center School, Elmwood and Hopkins School over the last four to five years, is an emphasis on the social and emotional learning and social mm -hmm. and emotional development. Um, we, of course, want to make sure that we have that emphasis on the core 
um, curriculum as well, the reading, writing, math, science, and social studies. But just as important, I think, is that we um, have that emphasis on social and emotional learning. And what that refers to is the way that children develop and learn to interact with other students, um, how to make good decisions, how to uh, cooperate and communicate and articulate their thoughts um, in a clear manner and be able to share ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think these are skills that are going to be um, of high value when these children, when the children that we have in front of us graduate in, from Elmwood School, we're looking at the year 2025 and 2026. Mm. So trying to think in terms of what skill sets these children will need in that year um, is, you know, you, you can leave it to your imagination what kind of technology we will have at that time and what kind of skill sets our students will need to work in an ever-expanding um, global market where um, the world isn't as big as it used to be. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be interacting with, um, you know, peers and colleagues that work on the other side of, of the globe and how to understand and value um, the different perspectives and uh, ways of doing business, um, I think is going to be just as important. So that starts, I think, very early on with mm -hmm. the social and emotional development and learning. Um, one of the... Um, yeah, I was going to say, we don't have a crystal ball, but you have sure. some good reference <laughs> materials there. I, I did want to reference, uh, this is a great book. It's called Yardsticks, and it's actually written by Chip Wood. And um, all of the classroom teachers at Elmwood School have received a copy of this, and mm -hmm. we've um, talked a little bit about some of the philosophies um, that are presented in this book. And actually, a lot of um, what's in here is about the developmental learning of students mm -hmm. and what we might expect of students at certain age levels. And I would encourage um, any parents out there who are wa watching this program um, to pick up a copy of this book because it actually highlights the different developmental ages of students from ages four up through 14. 14 yeah, yeah. And it's a gradual stage of development. And one of the most important things that we need to think about is that all children develop at different levels and different um, stages of their, of their lives. So not all four and five year olds are gonna have the same developmental levels, but this helps to provide a framework for understanding what we can expect those children um, to be ready for learning. And so from the educator's perspective, this helps us to craft the way that we um, teach students by developing lessons that are appropriate for them. And by having 23 or 24 individual students in our classroom, this gives us a perspective on how to understand them a little bit better. So I wanted to um, highlight that. All right, you had a couple others? Yes, um, there's another uh, book called Teaching Children to Care. And this goes along with our responsive classroom that uh, is a model of seven principles. There are seven principles that, um, that go along with the responsive classroom philosophy. Mm. And what that is is um, helping children to care about themselves, helping children to learn how to respect themselves and others, and helping children to learn about empathy. Um, which I think is such an important skill set mm. um, as children grow and develop to be able to put them their themselves into other shoes and, and to be able to understand multiple perspectives. So this goes along with the social and emotional learning. And as the school year progresses, um, I will be having a couple of um, principal coffees and one of the topics will be about social and emotional learning. So um, I would encourage any parents that are interested in that topic to come and have a discussion about it. When you said there's seven um, guidelines or seven things you focus on there, it was flashing through my head. I remember that book, Seven Habits of Highly uh, Effective. Yes, uh, yes. Seven Habits of Successful People or yes. something like that. Yeah. But uh, And that, to me, also would be very helpful maybe in preventing some of the bullying that we hear about in schools. Absolutely. If, if it kids absolutely get does. this. Yes. attention at earlier ages. And it, and it helps children to connect their actions with, um, you know, for every action there's, there's a reaction or, you know, um, somebody else is, is always on, on that, uh, the other end of things. So mm -hmm. it helps children to have that ability to 
have perspective about making good choices. And part of uh, what we try to institute K-5 to with our philosophy of education and our discipline is making sure that children understand um, the effects of their actions. So um, it's a non-punitive approach. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like the old days at all where um, children may have had a very stern talking to or now it's, it's about let's reflect on what happened. Um, how did this make you feel and how did this make the other person feel? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do or what can we do to, together to uh, make a better choice next time? And we lay out a plan together um, with individual children um, that need that support. Um, so I, I think it's a great approach and what's mm -hmm. really um, also unique is that we're, because in our school district we have so many um, changes from K to one and then children go to another building two to three and then mm -hmm. another building four to five, having the consistent approach across all three buildings um, enables teachers to institute similar expectations, but it also sets children up for success because the children know what's expected of them. Consistency is good at young ages. Yes, absolutely. Did you have one more you wanted to touch on? One more reference? Yes, um, there was one more that, um, this was, this is titled Responsive, Responsive School Discipline, mm -hmm. and um, Mrs. Lauren DeBeau, Mr. Tim Kernan and I um, each have had an opportunity to attend the Responsive Classroom course for administrators. And uh, this also helps, um, is, is another guide for um, us to have consistency in terms of instituting um, a system that's consistent mm -hmm. throughout each of the school buildings. So responsive school discipline is just that. It's how to, um, how to manage uh, students in a way that makes sense and that um, makes them responsive and responsible for their actions and their words. And uh, what we try to do is um, refer to this when, um, when we're instituting, in the beginning of the year, our expectations for our students in all of our school buildings. Mm -hmm. um, so this is another great resource that I would encourage uh, both um, parents and teachers to reference. Yeah, I was going to say all three of those really, if the teacher, if the parents and the teachers, <laughs> but you know, the parents want to see how this very important area is going to be addressed in the schools. They could get all three references and absolutely, and then yeah. maybe even learn a few things they could use at home with yes, their children and, and absolutely. encourage them. Yeah. Um, as the um, new school year gets underway, are there special areas or focus um, programs that you're looking at? And Elmwood, what do you want? Yes, we're very excited to have the preschool joining us this year at Elmwood oh, that's School. Great. Mm -hmm. So this is a great opportunity, I think, for the preschool teachers to be part of um, an environment that's uh, geared for an elementary level. I know that um, Mr. Alan Keller at the middle school has uh, worked um, alongside myself and Lauren DeBeau to talk about um, and to plan for this transition. Mm -hmm. So we will be housing the preschool until the new building for the center school is completed. Yes. And I, I believe that we'll be having the pre-K for about three years. We're mm -hmm. already doing some planning um, to have some of the preschool teachers incorporated with the, uh, with the Elmwood school teachers and some of our professional development opportunities. And I am particularly excited about the opportunities that this opens for second and third grade students to interact with uh, the, their pre-K um, counterparts because it gives them an opportunity to be um, role models and to do things like uh, uh, buddy reading and mm -hmm. uh, to pair up with uh, younger students and maybe do some role modeling with them. Uh, I think that'll be a particularly great experience that they could only have if they were in the same building. So that's very exciting. Well, when my son was in school, there was no pre-K <laughs> back in those days. Yes. Yeah, I'm kind of yeah. curious as to how uh, pre-K is going to differ from kindergarten and you know, and then into first grade. So you were always getting your children ready for kindergarten. Now you got to get them ready for pre-K. Yes, What age does that start? Uh, four. Four? Yeah. Okay. So I think pre-K is really an introduction to having um, an opportunity to um, uh, ha have time with other kids, how to navigate through social situations, how mm -hmm. to share, um, how to articulate 
um, themselves and um, also to build stamina. So the, the pre-K day is an AM or a PM session, so it's about two and a half hours in the morning, two and a half hours in the afternoon, depending on, well, uh, regardless of which session that, that they are in. Mm -hmm. And this helps to build them their stamina up for uh, kindergarten. It also introduces them to um, letters, numbers, words. It increases their vocabulary. And overall, I think it increases um, their readiness um, to enter into kindergarten. And uh, having a full day kindergarten, I think, is wonderful. I think it's a great opportunity for our students in Hopkinton. And I think that we are already seeing some of the results of students coming from last year's kindergarten class mm -hmm. into uh, first, grade first grade and um, their readiness for learning, um, their maturity levels and their experience in pre-K and kindergarten uh, makes a big difference. Is pre-K optional? Are you seeing a lot of demand for it? I, I think there is a bigger demand. Um, there are uh, many, many uh, opportunities for pre-K. There are private mm -hmm. pre-K programs. I think um, more and more folks are becoming interested in that and I think it really all depends on the readiness of, of the child. So um, you know that's a very important decision that I think needs to be um, considered by parents when they think about the needs of, of, their, of their child. Well, it sounds like you're all ready for the school year. <laughs> yes, you're looking forward to it. I thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having If you'd me. like to find more information about Elmwood School, visit their website located on the screen below. For everyone here at HCAM, I'm Mary Arnott, and thank you for watching this episode of All About Hopkinton. I'm Dr. Jerry Goodman. And I'm Dr. John Mandeville. Age-related eye diseases such as cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, and diabetic retinopathy affect nearly 37 million Americans. With an aging population and higher rates of conditions like diabetes, the number of visually impaired people is expected to increase substantially in the years ahead. While age may bring on vision disorders, many conditions are preventable, and everyone at any age should take steps to maintain good eye health. Here's what you can do. Get regular screenings to check for potential problems. Take care of your overall health, know your family history, and be alert to health and vision changes that could be signs of something serious. Wear eye protection when needed, at work, playing sports, or working at home with tools, including sunglasses to guard against damaging rays from the sun. For more information on eye health and protecting your vision, visit GetEyeSmart.org.